Matthew, Natalie, Ali, or Al, sorry, I can't read. I won't remind you. This is going to be up at the start of class. I'm going to turn it off. So I'll give you another 30 seconds. And if not, you come to me after class. All right. Any questions before we begin from last week? Any questions from last week? No? All right. I'd like to begin with a question. And the question is this. And I'm turning the attendance off now. If you can sign in, you come to me after class. Uh, the question is this. Is there a difference between a title and a deed? Well, I'll phrase it true or false, make it easier. A title and deed are different. Make it even easier. That's why you don't have to answer it. A title and deed are different. True or false? Okay? That's your question. A title or deed? Okay. Of course, now I have to get this thing loaded. Start a polling session. Okay, and a couple of you actually emailed me, say you found this helpful. Okay, so a title and deed are different, true or false. Okay, and I'm going to start it now. Go. The title and deed are different, true or false. Different, true or false? A is true, B is false. This is the last time. All right. Stop in three seconds. Two, one. Okay. I'm going to try something different now. I'm going to ask you what you got before I show the results. Because I think what happened last week is as soon as I show the results, it's like, oh, I got it wrong. People are quiet. So I'm going to show the results after I start asking the questions. Let's try that. Where did I finish up last week? Who was last? Are you, are you next? Oh, I appreciate the honesty. I, I, I really do. Uh, Christina, what did you put true or false for this one? I uh, put true. Okay, why did you put true? Uh, I think the title has to do with a mortgage company. Okay. And the person should be coming in mortgage. Okay. Okay. I think it would be a true owner of the actual company, even though they're. Okay. Right. Mia, I think, are you next? Yes. Okay, Mia, what would you select? Um, I put true just because it is. That while I don't really know the difference, I feel like there wouldn't be a work, two words for the same thing. So you, th you think they're different? <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. So that, that's like test taking skills, right? Uh, is that Taylor? Yeah. What would you put? Um, I don't know the right answer, but I feel like the title is less easy. Ah. All right. Uh, let's see the results. Actually, now I'm quite curious. Ah, so virtually everyone said they're too different. Okay, that's right, they're different. This is one of the most basic mistakes that law students seem to make uh, without fail every single semester, and it's not really their fault. It's not their fault at all. Um, in common you know, discussion, people use the word title and deed interchangeably. These are distinct concepts, and I'll tell you exactly what the difference is. Okay, close this off. Yeah, I like that. Showing the results after before I give you give you the uh, thing. Okay, so a title, right? What's a title? A title is the legal relationship between a person and their property. Okay, a title is the legal relationship between a person and a piece of property. So whenever you ask, "Are you the owner?" What you're really asking is, "Do you have title to this land?" Right? What is your relationship to this to this land? Now, you can have a lease, right? You can have an ownership in fee simple. You can have a future interest. I'm giving you awful flashbacks, right? There are future interests. You got remainder, whatever it is. But the title is what the legal relationship exists between the person and the piece of property. Everyone okay with that so far? Okay. And there's a reason why I'm doing this, I'll explain in a minute. A deed, right, is the instrument by which title is transferred. 
Okay, the deed is the instrument by which titles transfer. And I'm going to put in parentheses a piece of paper to make it dumb and obvious what this is. A deed is a piece of paper, that's all it is. Maybe electronic, whatever, but it's a piece of paper which indicates that title is transferring from person A to person B. Okay? Everyone get that distinction. Try not to confuse it. Most of you got the multiple choice question correctly. Uh, Bradley, yes, sir. Is that correct terminology in all contexts? Uh, at least in this class. Cars and everything? At least in this class, yeah. I mean, yeah, people often use the word deed and title interchangeably, and they're not. Right? The, the deed is merely an instrument, a piece of paper, right, to signify that you have it. But the legal representation is title. Now, why did I begin the class with this question? Okay. The entire process, the contract of sale, all those many steps which you walk through in your reading, you say, oh man, that's all to try and get a deed. No, 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 no. The entire reason why you go through all those steps with the mortgage and the contingencies, the earnest money and all that stuff, is to get the title. That is what all this is about. You're trying to transfer title from person A to person B. And the means by which you effectuate that transfer is a deed. Good, everyone understand that. that after that, I mean, that's actually the only conceptually difficult point because students invariably confuse that um, uh, every single semester. So what I want to do now um, is walk you guys through the um, standard contract, which begins on page, what is it, 544 at the bottom. I want to walk you through this one step at a time. Uh, and then I'm, this one's from Illinois, actually, but it's pretty standard. Uh, and after that, I want to walk you through the Texas one, which is a little bit more simpler and has a few things which I want to focus on. Um, before I do that, has anyone in this room ever actually purchased a home? Wow. Okay, that's a lot more than I usually have. Anyone, anyone want to share experiences? Anyone want to care to talk about it? I can't see your name, Jack. Uh, that's, uh, I'll get your name eventually. Yeah, Jonathan, yeah. Because even for Professor Berman, you know, anybody should know your names, right? <laughs> these the, these ten cards they thought these are I've walked around the team for like this. <laughs> All right, yeah. Tell us about your experience, please. Well, uh, I've actually bought and sold the house. Cool. Um, pretty much whenever you buy the house, then you have to get a contract where you have the parties. Uh, you have to put up escrow money, kind of a deposit down, saying it's security, then you own that and all that. Then you have to go and get a title search to go in to do that. When it, that's what you were saying, title, I was kind of like, well, I'm putting the title like chain of title. All right, and we'll do that later this semester. And, um, then you go through all that, um, then you go to closing, transfer funds, and then they, in that, you're signing a deed, or the seller is signing a deed over you putting the property in your account. And you did the same thing. Did you use an agent of some sort? Yes, I did. I had a real estate agent. And did, you, did you know the guy? Did you have a good relation with him? Well, that's exactly. <laughs> now, does your mom give you a good deal? Uh, yes. Did she leave her face? Yes. Good. Except for the, uh, what she had to pay for. Uh, now, did anyone buy a house not with their mother or doing the, uh, do the dirty work? Uh, yes. Um, I had a real estate agent that I found on Facebook. Found Facebook? <laughs> did you friend him? Yes. Good. Uh, how, how'd the transaction go? It actually went great. Well, was this here in Houston? Yeah. Uh -huh. On her end, she did a really great job. The other agent on the other end was terrible. The other agent was terrible, okay. Okay, why, why, why terrible? What, what well, happened? I wasn't buying from a company, it was more of a uh, company, investment company. So, and then I was actually selling the property. Okay. So they were slow about doing everything. Did, the closing to, date, did you meet the closing date on time? No, I was trying to close. July 31st or August 1st, and I end up closing August 15th. So two weeks later. Yeah. But okay. the whole point was, I was my first day of law school was August 15th, so I didn't want to close on the day that I started school. I wanted to already be in the day, so it was a complicated situation. We had to close at a McDonald's at 10 o'clock at night, so they were slow about everything. Yeah. Anyone else have a different? The house is great. The house is great. <laughs> That's all that matters, right? Not, not, nothing else matters. Yeah. Uh, who else? Anyone else want to raise your hand? Isaac, what you got? I bought a house, sold it two years later, uh, bought a new house. Did you use the same agent, different agent? 
No, I did uh, The first one was uh, in Newtown. The second one was a, a new build, so uh, there were no agents until the second one. Okay, so, so it was a developer then, right? right. Anyone else want to share a volunteer? Yeah, Anthony. Uh, I bought a house, um, and the mortgage company was the worst. The worst. Why, why were they? Why were they the worst? What happened? On the closing date, they said that the seller needed to. It was a house with window units. Okay. And at the closing date, when they should be giving me the money, they said that the seller needed to put heaters in the house. And seller needed to put heaters in the house. Yeah. Okay. And the seller was not going to do that. They were going to be foreclosed on if my contract was, you know, rescinded or if we went over the line over the date. So I had, we had to go down the street to the bank and basically beg them to give me a loan that day. Did they give it to you? Yep. Okay. But the mortgage right? company's the worst. They want to know everything about you. And oh. then after they know everything about you, they still don't give you money. <laughs> Anyone else want to share something? Yeah, in the back. Is that Anna? Yeah. Well, I, I got a condo. That's a house? The condo, the house, what's the name? Oh, so you just bought it straight out? Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, I can't do the same. Uh, Sorry, I don't have it. Stormy. Stormy, yeah, please don't lose. Do you have it at home? Uh, yes. Okay, yeah, don't lose that, because if I, if you lose it, then you make your own, and that's fine, but I don't think you know more. Yeah, Stormy, go ahead. Um, I bought a house a few years ago, and um, I'm selling it. Yeah, I'm closing tomorrow. You're close. Whoa, what a perfect time. It's like this week with a piece of cake, right? You know this stuff already? Have you reviewed the Texas standard contract? Is that what you're using? I have no idea. <laughs> does, does this look familiar? I'll show you on the screen. This, this should look familiar. Does, it, does this look familiar right over here? Uh, yes. Good. Also, I don't know. It's like 300 or something. It's like, we've so you're not reading it. Wild. So here's a dirty <laughs> secret, right? Here's a dirty secret. Um, most people will never actually read their mortgage contracts and their sales contracts are so long. And the reason why is even if you read it and you have an objection, Stormy, will they make any changes for you? No. No. So you're stuck with it, right? It's the contract of adhesion. Does that sound familiar from contracts? You're mm -hmm. Why adhesion? You're stuck, right? You're stuck with it. You, you have no choice. Um, so I don't read contracts either. There's no point. Uh, if there's a dispute, then you can read it. But most of the time, it won't matter because you can't change the words anyway. So you're stuck with it. All right, anyone else want to say something? Yeah, Isaac. Well, I sold my house. Um, the stuff that, like, for instance, on a view of the track form, it's like this. Track is a Texas real estate commission. Yeah. And um, so, like, for instance, water stock, for instance, uh, I have one that's been with me and gave me the offer basically they could buy, buy it from us or, uh, or not. And so the options were like, all right, we just cross it out of the, the contract. And, so you, you were able to make uh, alterations to right. it? Right. So it's private party, private party. So yeah, with private parties, you have a little bit more leeway, but generally, if you're dealing with any big interest, they're not going to make any alterations. Anything else on this? All right, so for those, last one, go. I was just going to say, uh, and whenever I had my house, the last four feet of it, the fence was off, oh, and no. the neighbor had adversely possessed. So you knew about adverse possession and you didn't tell us last week? <laughs> Come on. Come on. Were you in this class? We're sitting right here. We talked about it for like three hours. <laughs> your neighbor adversely prevents your and you didn't raise your hand? I'm sorry. Yeah, you should be. <laughs> That's bad. Okay. Anyone else have an actually relevant experience to talk about? Okay, really last one. <laughs> When I, when I was in high school, my, my dad told me what an easement was. Oh. Because we had like a property, like a ranch property, but like we had to drive on local So you had a prescriptive road. easement. And uh, I didn't know what to do, but my dad said, okay. yeah, well, like I've been talking to, uh, I'm trying to, he says it's okay, but he won't give me an easement. Or whatever, but like I need an actual, like, he kept talking about how he needed an actual room because he was just worried that. The guy who owned this land would just like one day say, no, nah, you can't drive through my ranch to get See? there. So. Okay. I'm moving on now. So here are the general steps to buy a home. And, and this is not in any way meant to be, um, you know, thorough. Uh, but generally, the first step is that the buyer assesses how much money they want to spend. Um, you should be realistic and not have your you know, eyes in the sky. Um, then you can search for a property. 
this can be done by using a broker, or in some cases you can do it online, right? By yourself or on Facebook or whatever else you want to use. Um, at that point, the buyer negotiates the price with the seller, and they develop what's called an executory contract. Now, the phrase executory contract should sound familiar from contracts, right? That means you have some sort of a contract that's not executed right away. Both parties have to do stuff before the deal closes, right? It doesn't just say, okay, sign this widget, go. You have to actually do stuff. Okay, so what does the buyer have to do? He has to obtain um, a, a title search. And one of you mentioned a title search a moment ago. What is a title search? It traces what's called the chain of title. We'll do this more later this semester. But the purpose of the chain of title is to determine, does the person selling it actually have title? In other words, the person selling it is person A. He got it from person B. The person B actually have it well. Person B got it from person C. The person C actually have it well. Person C got it from person D, et cetera, et cetera. And believe it or not, a title search may go back hundreds of years. Um, in Texas, you may go back to the Texas War of Independence. You may go back to the Louisiana Purchase, right? If you have some very um, uh, expensive oil reserves, for example, they'll want to go back to the Louisiana Purchase, all the way back. Um, so this can, this, this can go uh, a lot of history with some old, musty records. Uh, in addition, another key factor is what's called a mortgage. We will study mortgages later in the semester. Um, so to correct some terminology, the mortgage, right? You say, oh, I have a mortgage. That's not the money that someone gives you. The mortgage literally refers to the lien put on your home. What do I mean by that? When you have a mortgage, they give you a boatload of money, the bank, right? And what does a bank get returned? They put their thumb on your property, right? They say, okay, that's nice. You can keep living there. But if you stop making your payments, we can get it back. We can foreclose the property. The mortgage refers to the bank's interest on the property. Right? The mortgage refers to the bank's interest on your property. What you get is called a note. Right? Note. You got these with your student loans. The note is what actually gives you the cash for your purchase. Okay? Um, in addition to the uh, mortgage contingencies, you have what's called inspection contingencies. Right? When you sign that contract, there's a chance that something's wrong. Um, someone mentioned windows, something or other. There might be termites, right? There might be structural damage. What if, as you're getting ready to buy the property, you hire a, 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 an inspector who determines that, you know, the foundations are cracking it, or the, the, there's a leak in the roof, right? Or maybe there's like, you know, lead paint, right? Or, you know, something bad. Um, you can call the thing off sometimes, depending if there's a certain threshold met. Now, if it's like, you know, something small, right? Uh, you know, the, you need a new coat of paint or maybe the tiles in the bathroom are a little bit cracked. You're not gonna con like cancel the contract over something small, but if it meets a, a certain threshold, you can actually null the entire contract, null the entire thing, okay? And this creates uh, a sort of a conflict between the buyer and the seller. The buyer wants to be able to back out easily. The seller wants to buy him. So when you're negotiating this contract, there's often a lot of a dispute over how strict it is, right? How easy is it for the buyer to get out of it, or how hard is it to keep them in the transaction? So that's often an ongoing dispute, okay? So after all that's done, the inspections are done, the mortgage is approved, you run to the bank and you beg for your life, right? Whatever it happens to be. Um, at that point, the deal is ready to close. Um, and the actual act of closing all right, this is what's called closing. You're, oh, what's your closing date? Closing means you bring the transaction to a close. At that point, you transfer the deeds. And again, what's a deed? I described it a moment ago. The deed is merely um, the instrument by which you transfer title. So when you give a deed from person A to person B, you're transferring title from person A to person B. Um, in some states, you're required to have the closing done in person. I think New York is one of them. Um, in most states, you can have the closing done through an agent or a third party, where you actually literally hand the keys from one person to the next. Did anyone do that with their closing, have them hand the keys over? Now, I'm going to make you flash back to property one. 
you remember livery of season? The twiggle, the clump of dirt. Remember that? That in medieval times, the way to transfer property was to take a clump of dirt and drop it in someone else's hand. You'd also take a little branch and you'd twiggle it in, in their hand for blind people. It's actually a, it's a thoughtful idea. <laughs> the idea of canning someone keys, right, derives directly from the livery of season that you physically transfer a um, representation of the property from person A to person B. So this, this, this ritual we have today, this closing, goes all the way back to jolly old England where you had this, this, uh, this livery of season. Okay? After the deed is uh, transferred, title is transferred, um, then you have something called recording. I am not going to cover recording yet. That comes later in the semester. But general, generally what that means is after you get the deed, you have to announce it publicly. And the way to do that is to go down to the county courthouse, whatever your jurisdiction calls it, and give a copy of that deed to the, to the clerk. And they record it. Now, it used to be recorded in a big book, and we'll do the book later. Today it's almost all done digitally. But the idea is, you made this transaction, we want others to know that this transaction exists, and the way to keep a unified record is through recordation or recording. Any questions in the general process by which land is transferred? This has a high overview. I'm going to go through the contract in a minute. Any questions on what I just explained to you? Moment ago. No? Make sense? Okay. Now go to 544 in your um, in your in your books, and I'm going to go through this. Not every paragraph in detail, uh, but I want to give you the give you the highlights so you have it. Um, the reason why jurisdictions like Illinois and Texas have these contracts is to standardize the transactions. It would be very um, costly and difficult if every single person wanted to buy a home started from scratch and started from a blank piece of paper. So these contracts are developed by state real estate commissions and the like to give people a starting point. Now, don't think that makes it necessarily fair to consumers. Keep in mind, the people writing these are the people involved in selling property. So invariably, these sorts of documents are designed to protect real estate agents. And that's, that's not necessarily a bad thing for other people in this business, but um, whenever you have a document drafted by the people in that line of business, that's generally how the documents are drafted with the interests of that industry in mind. Uh, but then again, they're, they're usually pretty straightforward documents, and, and Isaac and others have used them. They said they were all right, so we'll go through them. Uh, the parties who are the buyer and seller. Uh, that's usually the most important part. Um, second, what exactly is the property to be sold? Um, you may remember the phrase meets and bounds, right? This is the, uh, the way to describe how property is surveyed. Um, but you can also put an address, right? You know, 15, 15, you know, Mockingbird Lane, whatever it happens to be. Uh, but you may want to actually put meets and bounds to avoid the situation that, uh, uh, that Jonathan had where uh, the neighbor adversely possessed the fence, right? When you don't put specific boundaries in your contract, this sort of thing can happen. Uh, number three, a, a fixture. Um, this is a phrase which you may have heard of. Um, a, a fixture is like a piece of personal property that's embedded into the um, house. So an easy example is like if you have a bookshelf that's built into a wall, right? When you move out, you're not going to rip out the wall to take the bookshelf. If something is part of the house, when you move out, it stays there, right? Maybe you have like various appliances that are, that are literally built into the wall, like you know, refrigerator or, or an air conditioning unit or a garbage disposal, right? These sort of things, when you move out, you don't rip them out. And then you can specify exactly which fixtures will remain in the house when you leave. Okay. Uh, number four is the purchase price. Um, this is the dollar amount that you come up with to buy the house. And this is something that's negotiated over. Now, there's an important phrase here. She so says initial earnest money. Initial earnest money, right? Uh, is that Lane? Mm -hmm. What is earnest money or initial earnest money? What, what is that? <coughs> is that the money you put down? Yeah, exactly, a down payment, right? Lane, why would, why would you put down this earnest money? What's the purpose of it? To show that you're like committed to your Good, money. what does earnest mean? Honest, yeah, it, it, it's honest money, right? It's basically saying, okay, 
I am serious about this property. I'm going to put down some earnest money to, to tell you I'm serious about it. Because once you go through this process with the inspections and everything else, they, that is the seller, takes the property off the market. And by taking the property off the market, they are putting themselves at risk. Because what if you back out? What if you don't show? What if your mortgage falls through, right? So the earnest money is, okay, even if this transaction falls through, I get something. Now, the earnest money isn't given directly to the seller. That would be too easy, right? Because they'll steal it. It's put in what's called an escrow account. Um, is it Emma? Yes. Emma, what is escrow? You're you're in the ballpark, but what does escrow mean in general? Not even relate to houses being purchased. Um, That's fine, Bradley. Third party. Exactly right. So an escrow is a third party who holds onto money. The idea is we want we want this amount. Let's just say it's ten thousand dollars. Make it easier, right? We'll give you ten thousand dollars earnest money, right? And we're going to put this in a third party account. It could be a bank, it could be a broker, but the idea is. Neither side, neither the buyer nor the seller, can deposit or withdraw from it. It's there until the deal closes. Okay? And if the deal closes, that money goes to the seller, no big deal. But the trick is, uh, is, is that Samarita? Yes. I'm sorry, Samarita. What happens if the deal falls apart? Let's say the buyer backs out, doesn't qualify for a mortgage, etc. What happens to that money deposited in the escrow? Well, who has it at, during this time? Oh, the third party. Okay, so then I'm saying the deal falls through, the buyer backs out, gets scared, no mortgage, whatever it is, right? What happens to that money? You're the seller. What are you going to want to happen? You're going to want to come back to So, right, so, but who gets it? The third party? Well, the third party can't keep it, right? He's just an a, a, a intermediary. Okay. So, where does the money go when, there's a, when the deal falls through? Okay, so I see your, 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 your tension, right? Valerie, what do you think? When the deal falls through, the buyer backs out, what happens to this money in the escrow? I would guess the buyer. The buyer gets it back. Well, what do you think it depends on who gets the money, the buyer or the seller? What do you think the difference is? Maybe ah, so give me, just flesh this out, right? What are the possibilities here? Well, I'm um, just fault. Yes. Whose fault is it? Exactly right. So, Valerie, what happens if it's a buyer's fault? What if he just gets cold feet, backs out, like, you know what, I, uh, 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 you know, I, I don't want to buy this anymore, it's too expensive. Well, I'd say the seller gets the money's trouble with like, going through. Yes. Right? So if the buyer backs out and it's his fault, meaning there's not a good reason, the money goes to the seller. Right? Right? Uh, Phil. I just, just like a second. But what happens if it's the opposite, right? What if the seller backs up? You know what? Sorry, I found a better deal. I want to give this other guy the property. Forget it. Oh, the buyer probably gets money back. The buyer gets the money back. So there's actually, it depends on a dispute. And when you write out these contracts, right, you're going to spell out in detail um, who gets it and when, right? Depending what happens. Now, uh, uh, is that Kayla? Okay, well, let's use a harder question, right? Let's say the buyer's ready, the seller's ready, right? And at the last minute, the bank comes in and says, or like what happened to Anthony, right? Yeah, we're not giving you a mortgage anymore. We told you we would, we change our mind. Or the bank goes bankrupt, right? Everyone's ready to go forward, but the bank pulls out at the last minute. What happens then? Ooh, yeah. What happens then? Yeah, no, I, I can sense your uncertainty. It, it's, it's a tough question, and this gets litigated all the time, right? Uh, usually a mortgage has, I'm sorry, this contract has what's called a, um, a mortgage contingency. And if for whatever reason the bank pre-approved the loan and then either changed its mind or something else, the buyer gets his money back. The thinking is that that was not his fault, right? This is not a case where the buyer backed out randomly. The bank did something weird. So whenever you're the seller and you're engaging in these sorts of transactions, you're taking a risk that the other side follows through, 
that the bank follows through, that the inspections follow through. There's always a risk that something can happen bad. Uh, Jesse, your hand was up a minute ago. Yeah, I'm just curious. Does the earnest money also act as consideration protecting the buyer, or is it irrelevant since they've already signed a contract and contingency still needs it, it's, to be It's for both of their benefits, yeah. I mean, it, it is a form of consideration, but with an executory contract, unless the deal falls through, the seller may never see a penny of it, right? Because use the other example. The seller backs out, the seller never gets a penny of it. So it's not a, it's not a straight up contract with consideration and, you know, it, it, it's delayed for other things to happen first. So if there is, uh, so if the buyer just paid the earnest money and the seller just backs out yep. and there's no breach of contract, it's, he has that option unless there's reliance, is that how it works? It's not even a matter of reliance, it's are you following the terms of the contract, right? So if the seller backs out, there's a provision in this contract that says if the seller backs out, the buyer gets his money back. So, and so basically the contract spells out what happens and when. Make sense? But the, the seller therefore can kind of put in the contract about the, the bank and all that, that if yeah. the bank pulls out the seller's service. Yeah, but the buyer may not agree to those terms, yeah. right? So if you're the buyer, it's pretty standard that you're going to insist on a term that if the bank pulls out, it's not my fault. And so that's what I'm saying is all the negotiations should come up front, right? When you use one of these standard contracts, there shouldn't be surprises. Now, there's always, you know, I, I, had, a, I had a friend, had ha this happened to her, where uh, she closed on a house. No, I'm sorry, what it was. She lives in Austin, and, like, she had all the paperwork, everything was paid, and then, like, the day before she closed the house, there was this huge, huge flood. And like the house got ruined, and you know it, it's right on the cusp. So they could have canceled the mortgage because it would have failed inspection. So what I think happened was that the buyer and seller they reached some deal where he agreed to make the repairs, put up in a hotel for a few weeks, and they. But she could have pulled out, and then the entire deal would have you know not been not been nothing. But you know these sorts of things can happen. Uh, and well, I was Start from scratch, find a new buyer, right? Once a deal falls apart, they go back in the market and they, they start from scratch. Anything else? So the next item is a, number five, which is a, a similarly important event, which is the closing date, right? And a couple of you mentioned, I think Lauren said they had some uh, delays with her closing. The reason why you put this date here in, in very certain terms is so everyone knows what the deal is. You know you need to finish by July 31st, whatever it happens to be. You get it done by that day. You have your inspections, you have your title and search, whatever else. Um, if it stretches beyond the closing date, and this is something that Lori may have confronted, the deal can be pulled off, right? And if for whatever reason the seller drags his feet and doesn't get it done by the closing date, the buyer can get the earnest money back. Right, that's a breach. It's a material breach of the contract. You agree to use best faith efforts to finish by a certain date. Um, maybe if there's some extenuating circumstances, it's a different story, but you don't get it done in time. You don't get it done in time. And it's breached. Okay. Uh, number six is, again, you deliver possession, you deliver the keys. This is the modern day version of the liver of season. Uh, the, the rest I'll go through a little bit quicker, and that's quite as important. There are various disclosures involving um, lead paint and radon. That's a form of like radiation. You don't want that in your home. Uh, uh, prorations, number eight. This is actually important. Let's say that you know you move into an apartment on or a condo, I should say, on like you know August fifteenth, and you have half of the bills for the month, right? You have half the utilities, you have half the month of homeowners fees, you have half a month for whatever you know landscaping fees, whatever it happens to be. How are you going to handle that? And generally, you agree that the seller handles the first half and the buyer handles the second half. 
um, but they may not be able to split them up. So the proration decides how to handle various fees that come across within a given month. Um, paragraph number nine concerns attorneys making changes. And of course, attorneys are always allowed to make changes. That's how you all make a living and you, you bill fees if you're a real estate attorney. Um, but they're usually your time limits. And say any changes by lawyers must be made within five days, 10 days, whatever. And in the event that you can't agree on changes, then the contract can be terminated, right? And there's a refund of your earnest money. So even attorneys can drag a deal if you can't reach an agreement on what changes you make. Number 10 uh, concerns inspections. Now, um, for any of my friends who purchase homes, did you hire your own expert to inspect? Do you use their expert? How'd you do it? Uh, yeah, where'd you find them, or her? Um, I got some uh, recommendations from people that I know that have bought before. Was it, was it, did the inspector do a good job, as far as you can tell? As far as I can tell, you know, how did they slide into the next Did they, did they, did the inspector find anything? That, that, that they can flag. Nothing that were damaging to where we wouldn't want to purchase it. So this is stuff you could fix yourself or put yeah. in. Yeah. Did, did you? They want to have an inspector with attached some serious stuff. Yeah. Um. They bought. You paid for here. Go okay, so your inspector came in, found that the AC wasn't working, and they got a new one. Yeah, we stayed on the roof. And he actually did it before he closed. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Yeah. I had termites. I had to get the whole thing tinted. Termites? Oh man, how would they fix that? Forty-five hundred dollars worth of tent. Wow. Okay. It looked like a circus with it down. So, but did the seller cover that? Was that you? I paid for it, and then she took it off the purchase price. Ah, okay. I'm glad you said that. That's that's usually what happens, right? <coughs> if the inspector finds that there's some damage, what often happens is you renegotiate the purchase price. And then you deduct whatever it is to cost repairs. You had something similar? I didn't like my debt, so I make a little money. <laughs> yeah, so basically, they, you get compensated. So that's why the inspection is an important um, process. Uh, paragraph uh, number 11, uh, this is what I mentioned earlier the mortgage contingency. And I'll read the first sentence. It says, This contract is contingent upon the buyer obtaining a firm written mortgage commitment on or before you put a date. Blah, 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 And it keeps going. Uh, if for whatever reason the mortgage backs out and doesn't go through, the buyer can get his earnest money back. Um, so this is, again, to ensure that the bank doesn't screw up the last minute. You have to go plead to the bank mercy. Uh, homeowner's insurance, uh, this is important. Um, you have car insurance, you have life insurance, you have health insurance. You need insurance as the owner of a home to make sure that uh, if there's a storm, if there's flooding, especially, actually, flooding is tricky. Does anyone in Houston live in a floodplain? Anyone have that happen? Well, I don't know if it's a floodplain, but I'm required to buy flood insurance from my house. So if you can buy flood insurance, you're not in a floodplain. Okay. It's a weird thing. Um, <laughs> I would, all I know is I'm required to have it. Like, yeah. our homeowners, they won't let us. Stop. Yeah, so here, here's the issue, and this is an issue in Houston. A lot of the areas by Brazewood, by the Bayou, or, well, no, apparently in Houston, it's Bayou, not Bayou, right? Bayou. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, no, bio, bio. I was getting confused. Um, bio. 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 Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, in certain places are going to flood every single time. You know where they are because it's always whenever it rains, the cameras go there, and these people, they had one on Tax Day, Memorial Day. Um, if you live in certain areas, no one will sell you a flood insurance policy because you know you're going to use it every time, right? Um, so what happens is you have to buy it from the government. So you're buying insurance policy from the government that doesn't cover it because you know you get flooded every time it's, it, it rains. Um, so flood insurance, number 13, is especially tricky um, here in Houston. Um, a lot of people have to actually do is to elevate their houses a few feet, put on cinder blocks, basically, to, uh, to prevent it from uh, flooding. Okay. Uh, number 14, um, condo fees. Okay, you bought condos. I want to pause at number 15 for a minute because it's probably the most important paragraph in the entire um, uh, uh, contract, and it concerns the deed. Now, all of you know a deed and title are not the same thing. But what does it say? Seller shall convey to buyer a good 
and merchantable title to the real estate by a deed. So that explains it, right? The way you convey title is through a deed. We talked about this before. But the most important phrase is good and merchantable title. Simone, does this look familiar, this phrase, good and merchantable? Does this like ring a bell or something you may have said last term? Good and merchantable title? Yeah, what does it remind you of? It should ring a bell or something. Also, contracts. What do you think it means, good and merchantable title? What does, that, what does that mean? Use it to, to, to define it without using the same words. Um, Try that. It has to be a clean title. Clean. Oh, okay. Getting better. Chester, what do you think? What does this, what does this remind you of? Um, uh, Merchantable. What, what's that sound like? You, you've done this. Oh. <laughs> uh, okay. Torts. Use it. Torts as well. What is that? Go back. <laughs> no, you're, you, 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 re, you tap back in, as it were. I'll tap in. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> UFC goods. UFC is tap to what? Ah, there it is. There it is. Yeah, okay, good. You used to see good. Tell us. Exactly. Go. More. Oh, what more? <laughs> more. Um, so, the person with the title, uh, he's a merchant of that. So, do you remember the implied warranty of, ah, thank you, yes, the implied warranty merchantability, right? This is a concept in the UCC, exactly right, Chester said, where something conforms to the buyer's expectations. That sounds familiar, right? When you're selling a widget or whatever it is, the item has to conform to the buyer's expectations. That applies just the same to property. Now, property is not governed by the UCC, right? Property is much older than the UCC. Before there was such a thing as a good and merchantable title, I'm sorry, before there was an implied warranty of merchantability, there was this good and merchantable title. And we'll spend a lot of time discussing what it means for a title to be merchantable, but if you want to summarize it in a single sentence, no defects, right? There are no defects. The, the, the title is not defective, and that's not like in torts, where if you sell like you know an engine, then it blows up and, and injures you. Right now, that's not what a defect means. It are there flaws in the title, right? Does someone have a claim of adverse possession against it? Does a bank have a mortgage against it? Is the person selling it to you an absolute crook, and they don't actually own it? Now. You can still sell property with all these things wrong with it. In fact, usually if you want property on the cheap, you buy property with problems. But they got to disclose them, right? The key point here is the title can still be merchantable if you disclose all these errors and flaws. If the person still wants to buy it after all that, well, that's on them, right? They're taking a risk. People speculate in real estate. They buy property they maybe shouldn't. But that's their call. Everyone get that. So paragraph number 15 with a good and merchantable title is probably uh, the most important paragraph in the entire set, uh, contract. That, that's the bottom line. That's what you're trying to get. You're using the D to get to this title. Any questions on that? Questions on the title 15? No? Uh, all right, title 17, I'm sorry, pa paragraph uh, uh, 16, yeah, basically title, it's the same thing over and over again. Uh, number 17, the uh, plat of survey. Again, this is making sure that the boundaries are where they say they are. Okay. Uh, number 18, is escrow closing. Uh, this refers to the money held by the third party. Ah, uh, this is at 19. 
damage prior to closing. This is what happened to my uh, my friend who there was some flood like the day or two before the house uh, closed, and often they'll have to work something out uh, uh, with a seller who's usually going to be on the hook because the buyer can just back out. Real estate tax, don't worry about that. Um, seller representation, the seller has to make sure they disclose any zoning disputes, any boundary disputes, any improvements, etc. Okay, paragraph 22 concerns the condition of the real estate. Uh, paragraph 23 concerns various tax issues. 24, business hours, right, whatever. Paragraph 25, facsimile or digital signatures, important. Uh, ah, 28 is important. Time is of the essence. This sounds familiar. Time is of the essence is the contract's term, right? This means that both parties have a general good faith obligation to move the proceedings along at a reasonable pace. You can't have one party drag their feet and try and get out of the contract, right? Once you sign this, you have to move uh, at a reasonable pace. Uh, choice of law provisions. Uh, uh, representation of buyers in real estates, okay, nothing there. Uh, contingencies, more of the same. Wells, uh, wood destroying infestation, there's your termite uh, provision. Termites are not good. Um, as is, uh, okay. all right, that's all I want to that's the general standard one. Any questions then? I'll show you the Texas one in a minute. Any questions on the general standard one of Illinois? All right, let me show you this one. The Texas Real Estate Commission, TREC, or TREC, not TREC, but TREC for short, has um, a series of templates for every conceivable purchase you want to make. If it's a one family, uh, a one family home, uh, an apartment, a farm, oil, whatever it is, right, they will give you a template. And this one I think is a little bit easier to understand than the one in your book. It's a little bit simpler. But I want to jump down to the final page because it, the Texas form makes something very clear that the um, Illinois form doesn't. Okay? So the final, on the final page, it's called uh, broker information, right? And there's a sign for one broker firm and for a listing broker firm. And I'm gonna zoom in so you can see all this, see this, right? There are these check boxes, right? And it says the buyer serves as the buyer's agent or represents the seller as the listing broker's agent. Uh, Walker, what are, why does the Texas form have these specific check boxes, right? What is it trying to um, reveal to a potential buyer. What, what, why would they have this, these, these features here? Uh, I don't know, just to clearly all parties that are involved with the sale. Well, when you go and you hire a broker to help you buy a house, who does that broker work for? You alone. Well, they work for like, well, yeah, they work for a company, but who's loyalty? Who do they have loyalty to? Well, though, well, good, but who's paying them? Oh, no, no, one at a time. So don't take that turn, please. Because that's your room, it's your classmate. Well, who's paying them completely? Thomas, what do you think? Who does a it's the, who does a, who does a broker work for? Uh, their firm, so like Keller Williams or. Oh yeah, they work for Keller Williams. That's fine. Right. Who do they look like? Do you share a duty to? Yeah. One at a time, please. Please one at a time. Thank you. Go ahead, Thomas. You're on the floor. They're whoever's signing your paycheck, which is that broker. Is right. That's not right. Uh, I can't see your name tag. Oh, I forgot. Bring it next time. What's your name? Uh, this is Derek. 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 Who does a broker owe a duty of loyalty? Okay. So this is actually one of the trickier parts of this entire topic, and one that uh, uh, students and even people who buy property don't fully understand 
Go to page three fifty uh, uh, five sixty three for a minute. We'll get to we'll back to the Lakari case in a minute. Let's do five sixty three in question number one. Uh, uh, John Paul, you want to read it for us? Page five fifty three, question number one. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit louder, I can barely hear you. The guy that Alright, so let's, I'll, I'll start the polling in a minute, it's going to be a true or false question. But the question is this, you're a buyer, you tell your broker that you're looking for a house with a white picket fence, a swimming pool. And you tell your broker that you're max, right, you're not going to spend more than $870,000, that's it, that's your, that's your ceiling. The broker finds a property with a white picket fence and a pool. But the asking price is $899,000. Okay. The broker has never met the listing broker of that house. Okay. So the question is start right now. Is there a duty? Yes or no? A is yes, B is no. Does your broker? have a duty to tell the other broker, yes or no? A or B? Yes, there's a duty, A. No, there's no duty, B. Here okay, we get the question. Okay, another five seconds. Now, all right, John Paul, what you put? Does your broker, the guy you're working with, have a duty to tell the other broker that number? Yes. Okay, why do you say yes? Wait, but, but just telling, if, if your agent, right, your agent knows that your limit's 870, do you want to disclose that with negotiations? Eventually, but is it, is it in your interest, right? You're John Paul, right? You want to buy this house with a white picket fence. Do you want your agent spilling the beans what your upper limit is? What's a good negotiate technique? What would you usually want to do? Low ball, right? What if you come right out and say, my max is 870? What does the what does the seller know then? What does the seller know if you tell them what your maximum price is? Or they'll just throw you and say, nope, not going to take it, not going to waste my time. Right? What do you think, uh, John? <laughs> Does, would you put A or B? Is there, is there a duty or not? I put no. You said no? That, that, that your agent to keep it secret. Yeah. Well, I would say you're more along for the negotiation. Lauren, what'd you put? Oh, I put that they did have a duty. I'm sorry, did or did not? They did. You did letter A? Yes. Okay, why'd you put A? Because if you know that you're but the question is, what if that's harmful, though, right? <laughs> Telling that number is against your client's interest. Justin, do you have the duty to disclose it, even if it hurts your client? I, I believe they have a fiduciary relationship or duty to the seller at home, but I don't think that, obviously, that would hurt your client by telling you the price, I think. I don't think that... You guys are all missing the question. It's not about whether it helps or hurts, right? Who is the duty owed to? Hanan, is that it? Yeah. Hanan, who does you, that your broker owe a duty to? Ah, no. No. The seller. The seller, why? I don't know. It's just 
the traditional broker arrangement, the listing agent and the seller, selling agent both represent the seller. Okay. So about two thirds, the answer's A, right? Here's the dirty secret, right? Here's the dirty secret. The listing broker, right? The person who puts the listing out. And the selling broker, the person who brings the buyer there, they work together. So again, the listing broker, that is the person who puts the listing out in the marketplace. And the selling broker, they work together. Wait, one second. Believe it or not, believe it or not, the selling broker, the guy you walk into the Keller Williams and you hire him, he does not work for you. He's looking out for the seller to get the highest price possible. That way his fee is higher, which he splits. So when you hire a selling broker, you don't have a you don't have a dog in the fight, right? And if you tell your selling broker, here's my limit, they're gonna disclose that to your detriment. And there's some study in the book, I think it's listed, that 75% of buyers think that a selling broker represents them. He doesn't. He represents the seller. There is something called a buyer's broker, which is not new, but it's newish, right? A buyer's broker is someone who represents the buyer. Right? A buyer's broker represents the buyer. So here, the correct answer is A, right? The correct answer is that your broker is obligated by fiduciary duty to disclose them. <clears throat> Isaac and Hannah? Come on. Yeah, Isaac. My, my question was essentially was that developed for economic reasons. Yep, yep, they split the fee. Yeah, that's exactly right. They split the fee and they want a higher fee. They, they, they don't want low bulk prices. So the negotiation, and we'll see this in the next case, in, in an egregious example, is designed to maximize the fee. Can I? I was going to ask if you have to hire a broker. No, you don't have to hire a broker um, in, in most states. In some states, you're actually required to work with one. Uh, Isaac, I don't think Texas requires one, right? You can do it yourself. What? We do one for our own office. Some, some, some states require these, and some states you don't. But the alternative is you can hire a buyer's broker who actually works for you now. <clears throat> buyer's brokers are unpopular, right? Because they're trying to drive down the cost, and they don't always get paid, right? The reason why. This, the fee is split is that the listing broker and the seller's broker have a contract. They agree to split the fee. But no one agrees to split the fee with the buyer's broker. I had a student sat right there a couple years ago. I remember when students sit, it's a weird thing, sat right there. Um, he was, in a previous career, a, a buyer's broker. And he said he was hated. Right? Because when he walked in, he'd be like negotiating down. And, he, and they're like, get out of here. We don't want to deal with you. Because uh, that means they have to split their fee with someone else. And they don't want to do that. But that is the dynamics we have here. All right, so any questions on the uh, on this question, on, on whether there's the, the, the duty? Brett? When I'm trying to buy a house and I hire a buyer broker, then that buyer broker tries to get their fee from the seller? Yeah, it's a struggle for them sometimes. They may not want to give it. Because they're not in a contractual relationship. They, whoa, we didn't agree with you to give you any money. We're not giving you anything. So sometimes you might have to pay your buyer broker out of your own pocket. Right, because agents will say, "Oh, you don't pay us a penny; we'll just take out the closing." Right, mm -hmm. but with the buyer's broker, you got to pay out maybe separate. But this is an aspect of fiduciary law. Yes, Yusuf. So not a buyer's broker, but a regular broker that's working for the buyer, he will just go up and tell yep. them what their max price is. Yep. Worth. His duty is not to you. His duty is to sell it. Which seems it seems wrong, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, Anna. Oh, it's a Isn't that crazy, right? Yeah, he was like pointing out things to her that she thought was wrong. And but don't tell the good stuff, right? Yeah. Because you can't be honest with them because they're going to squeal on you and tell it to the other guy. Uh, to hand somewhere else. Oh, well, I was just going to say, so it's basically in your best interest not to really tell the broker anything. Isn't that strange, though, right? Don't you, you want to be honest, but yeah, it's, it's your interest not to because they can use it against you. 
Uh, you don't have a choice most of the time because a lot of the time I'm not going to show you any Hold on, guys, 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 what, one at a time, please. One person at a time. Don't talk out of turn. A lot of times yeah, I'm going to show you. still talking. Please stop. Thank you. Jesse. A lot of the times I'm going to show you a home until you get a free fall from a, a, you know, yep. a mortgage banker and can they then show you know, any of the other agents, the listing agent, yep. what you're qualified for? Can you tell them I don't want you to disclose the amount of But it doesn't matter if you tell them their duty's not to you. Yeah. Uh, David. Yeah, um, what about like laws, regulations, about like what they can say to you, like what if they, uh, as far as misrepresentation, like- Well, oh, that's I'm, the I'm next case, you. right? So, so th th that's the next case. They don't have a duty to you, right? But they can't commit fraud. And the next case is where they fail to disclose stuff. That's where it goes off the rails. So Megan, why don't you give me the facts please in Lakari versus Black Welder. Okay, so um, it's siblings that inherited a home from their parents. Okay. They decided to sell. Okay. Um, so they contacted the real estate agent who hired the defendant. Um, okay, good. I guess they were going to split the commission. Ah, uh, well, it's a little bit, little bit more, more, more dirty than that. What actually happened here? Um, so the defendant, uh, the defendant who was the, I guess he's a broker, he like had prospective buyers that gave them like what they're asking, or like that we're going to pay the asking price, but then the defendant decided to buy it himself. Yeah. And he under said, what circumstances did he buy it himself? It was a very weird circumstance. He didn't give, he didn't give the, or he didn't give them the actual option. Yeah. Is that, is that what you're asking? Uh, in what time frame was the, pur was the, was the purchase made? That's what I'm looking for. Um, what, so the seller, so he like purchased, I don't understand. Anthony? He had a fed 24 hour period yeah. at 125000 and he bought it for one fifteen. Did anyone think this looked a little bit odd when you read this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so basically what happened was you have these brothers and sisters who inherited a property in Westport, Connecticut. And you may not know this, but Westport, Connecticut is one of the wealthiest places in the country. Uh, like Martha Stewart lived there, right? This is a very wealthy neighborhood. Um, and these people were not sophisticated. You know, they just inherited the property. They didn't really know what was going on. So they call a local broker, right? Who they think is their friend. No. <laughs> that broker then calls uh, uh, the other broker in uh, Westport, the defendants, Black Welder. And they say, okay, we'll, we'll reach an agreement. We'll split the commission, right? This is how this works, right? They split the commission. Their interest is not in helping out the uh, a seller in this case, as it turns out. Um, for reasons that I can't even fathom, the uh, seller has agreed to a 24 hour right to sell. The price it put out was 125, but then the broker came in and, and bought it for 115. And then, a couple days later, right, they turned around and they sold it for 160. Right? Even worse, the person they sold it to was a neighbor who the plaintiffs did not want to be sold to. So this was basically a ruse, right? You had a prospective buyer. They said, no, 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 don't sell it to this person. We don't like him. So then the, the, the broker himself bought the property, flipped it over like a couple days later for $45,000 more, right? So Robert, what's, what's problem? I mean, there's a lot of problems here, but, but what, what are some of the problems with this transaction? Uh, well, the first is the uh, defendant's breach their duty with the plaintiffs by avoiding the information that the other plaintiffs provide. Now, what what duty is this? They had a fiduciary duty. To them. Now, didn't I just come out and say to all of you that an agent does not owe a duty to the plaintiff? You know, Anna was saying that you have to be quiet. You can't tell what you actually think. You can't trust these people. What? Where does this duty come from? Uh, when you said there's no duty. That uh, as a real estate broker, they have a, a duty to give them the best price. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, I'll see a name tag. Bring it next time. Okay, so, so what, what is this duty? Well, the plaintiffs were the sellers, right? So wouldn't the, the brokers have a duty to them? Good, but specifically, even if it's a question of duty to this, duty to that, what are brokers never allowed to do under any circumstances? Well, they have to. They have, to, they have to help you get the best deal. So they have to tell you if there's a deal on the table. Well, not just have to get you the best deal. What can't, what is illegal? What can never be done? Well, they can't withhold the information. You can't commit fraud, right? 
So even despite this or that, this duty or that duty, right, it's against all norms of decency in this field to withhold information. And you also can't do something called self-dealing. Remember what that is, right? Where basically you take a position that's solely for the benefit of the broker. So here, the court held that there were two problems, right? They breached the duty owed to the plaintiff, and again, it was the seller, so they, there was a duty present. But they intentionally misrepresented facts to induce them to sell the property. They had to do this stupid 24-hour exclusive deal. They failed to disclose that their own guy was buying it, and that was going to be flipped around a week later to the neighbor who they didn't want it to go to. So this is one of the rare cases where the court finds a violation of fiduciary duties with respect to real estate agents. And this is a very egregious case. Um, uh, the, the brokers have an obligation to make a full, fair, and prompt disclosure of all facts. And they have a duty to communicate a more advantageous sale. So here the broker is liable, whatever losses the principal suffered, which is probably $45,000 and then some, plus you get your fees paid, right? As a lawyer, the most important rule of being a lawyer is get paid. Uh, uh, so a lot of these cases are brought on the contingency that you're expecting to get paid. All right. Do everyone understand the first uh, Lakara case? Any questions on that? They, don't think that this is common. Usually real estate agents get out scot-free. They do this sort of thing all the time. Uh, uh, most of the time, after the um, property person closes, it's like, all right, whatever, I'm moving on. The fact that they found out here means that they were still involved. Usually it's these closed. I mean, Lauren, you're Facebook friends with your realtor. How often do you talk to this person about your transaction after the fact ever? Um, actually, not. Oh, good. So you actually followed up with them? Yeah. Good. Well, usually people don't. You're like, all right, I'm done. I'm done. See? Responsible property. Good. Uh, garbage. Oh, things didn't work? Yeah. Then they came back to fix it? Good for them. Good for them. Okay. All right. So any questions on the, uh, any questions on the um, Lakari case? Uh, yeah, Anna. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question. Uh, I think it's a now. I don't think it's a difference. I, I mean, if you're, if, you, if you're a licensed, I think, who was a licensed real estate agent in here? I'd assume a couple of years ago that was. Um, I don't think it makes much of a difference if they call it. I'm not sure. All right, any other questions in the first case? Okay. All right, let's go on to the second topic um, for today, which is something that you certainly learned about in um, contracts. Don't lie if you didn't. Uh, called the statute of frauds. Um, now the good news is, the good news is that the statute of frauds is a lot easier for property than it is for contracts. The contracts is actually fairly complicated. Here, there's only one rule. Okay, one rule. The document must be signed by the parties to be bound. Beautiful simplicity, right? The document must be signed by the parties to be bound. What does that mean? If you want to transfer property, the people involved in the transaction must sign it. That's it, right? In uh, the Texas Code, section 26.01, uh, a promise or agreement must be made in writing and signed by the person to be charged with the promise. Okay? Um, within Texas, this rule applies to um, the sale of real property, a lease of longer than a year, uh, a, a promise to pay commissions for the sale of oil and gas leases. Um, any sort of property interest that you want to convey, odds are you're going to need to have a signed writing. Now, the reason why we have the statute of frauds and the reason why we have signed writings is to prevent Fraud, right? That's why it's called the statute of frauds. You're trying to prevent fraud. Um, when you have a document that's not signed by the parties that are bound, uh, there's a large possibility of someone committing fraud. Okay, so that's the rule. 
And as with any rule, there are exceptions to the rule, right? Uh, Kaylee, ah, thank you for spelling that out. Thank you so much. Kaylee, what are... <laughs> thank you. It, it, these things make your life a lot easier. What are exceptions to the statute of frauds? Give me a couple. Or two. Um, well, I believe that one of them was the... Uh, uh, Sorry, I'm you Well, from the reading last night. Not, you don't have to remember all the way back, but what are some exceptions to the statute of frauds? Um, well, you can't orally agree. Um, you can't okay. What's, uh, right, so what's an exception? We don't need to sign writing. That's my question to you. Um, okay, what do you call that reliance doctrine? What's that word? Well, what's the word for it? You want a time? Yeah, go ahead. Estoppel, very good. What's estoppel? Um, basically, if two parties contract, one is stopped from saying that there was no agreement. Okay, good. Um, estoppel is a general equitable concept, which sometimes you refer to as detrimental reliance, right? That one party makes a promise relying on another, and something went awry, and because the party relied on it, Courts may enforce the contract anyway as a matter of um, equity. It's sometimes called unjust enrichment. It's sometimes called detrimental reliance. Call it fairness, if you will. But when there's some sort of unconscionable injury from denying the enforcement of an oral contract and one party relied on it, courts can enforce the contract anyway. Okay? So that's a stopple. Uh, is that Amy? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Christine. What's another exception to um, the statute of frauds? Uh, parts performance. And what that is, please. Um, it's like completing a portion of the of, a, of what was agreed on. In yeah, contract. right. That's where, like, you know, let's say that the purchase price is a hundred thousand dollars, and then you pay like ninety thousand dollars, and that's and you know, so I'll pay you back the other ten thousand dollars next week. Um, in some cases, courts will say you did enough, there's partial performance. Even though the contract doesn't meet the statute of frauds, you didn't meet the terms, we will enforce it. Um, part performance is not unlike a sopple. They're basically the same thing, right? If a court decides that something is unfair, they will enforce the contract even if it's not complying with the statute of frauds. All right? So this is the last case. Uh, Cody, what were the facts in Kiki versus Green? I'm not prepared for this case when I talk to Okay, you go first. Next class. Yes, Virginia, what are the facts here in uh, Hickey versus Green? Uh, so Green um, made an oral agreement with the Hickeys to sell them a parcel of land. Good. Uh, and they gave a $500 deposit. Okay, well, be careful. What what exactly was given? Be, be very precise here. No, it, it was $500. Oh, a deposit check? It was a check, okay. What was written on the check? Um, subject to deposit on Mass Destroy Avenue. Okay. Subject to variance from the Okay. Uh, or the Was the check completed in its entirety? I don't think so. What was missing from the check? Was it the, oh, the appropriate name? Yeah. Was the name written who was made out to? Um, it wasn't, there wasn't a name. Okay, now, who signed the check? Okay, the buyer signed the check. Now, you may never think about this, right? You've all used, used checks before, right? The person who gives you the check signs on the little corner of the bottom, right? And then what do you do when you want to cash it? You yeah. sign on the back. Flip it over and sign up. Do you ever think of what you're complying with? It's a statute of frauds. Oh. Both parties are signing it, right? A check is merely a commercial instrument. It's a piece of paper, right? But that's saying, I, Josh, convey to you, Virginia, $500 or whatever, right? I sign, you sign, you got a transaction. Now, Virginia, did the, did the seller ever sign the back of the check? No, she stuck it in a drawer somewhere, right? Instead, I say, what did the, um, what did the seller do? Uh, the seller backed out. The seller backed out. And who did she sell to instead? Um, someone else. For what price? Higher price. So this seller, right, is not very scrupulous. 
She got this check. She's like, okay, whatever, put it in her drawer. Found someone else willing to buy it for $1,000 more and then sold it to this other person. Now, I say, during this time when this transaction was going, what did the buyer do? The buyer did something that probably was a little, a little not that smart. He, or whomever the buyer is, sold their house. Yeah, he sold his house. And it sold, how, how quickly? Really quickly. Right away. <laughs> so basically, the dude's house sold right away. He's like, all right, I want to move in. And he's like, sorry, we sold to someone else. So David, what did he sue for? Specific. specific performance. What specific performance? Like, it's not money. It's like the like or the, 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 like the, the property. The, the, yeah, he the sued for the specific value of the property, right? He wanted the transfer, right? He wasn't suing for money. He said, "I want you to transfer the property to me." Okay. So, what did the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court find here? An oral land transfer contract may be enforceable uh -huh. despite violating the statute of frauds if the party seeking enforcement detrimentally relied ah. on the agreement and they found that that was what happened. Okay, was very good, very good. So the court found detrimental reliance, right? The court found there was detrimental reliance. This is like a textbook, black letter case, right? The guy literally sold his house in reliance on the, 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 the promise that he would get this piece of property, okay? And so the court cites restatement, and they say that there's a detrimental reliance, a stop, et cetera, et cetera. But, Mark, here comes the rub. Does the Supreme Judicial Court order the transfer of the property from A to B, from the buyer back to the uh, seller? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, from the seller to the buyer? No. Why does the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts <laughs> stop short of that remedy? Because that would be an over exertion of their authority. Why? Because it would it would require the person now living in it ah. actually to vacate. Do we know who's living there now? We don't. We don't. So this is an aspect of courts which law students never quite grasp, which is a court of appeals can't find new facts. Yeah. The only way to find new facts is through a trial court. Now, this case was going on for nearly two years. Do we know who's living in the house at this point? No. Do we know where the buyer's living at this point? No. Are we to believe that the buyer has been homeless now for two <laughs> years, no. waiting for this court to resolve? What did he probably do, the buyer? He moved on. He moved somewhere else. So if he moved, finish it up, Mark, if he moved somewhere else, what relief is there left? Do we really need specific performance? No, he probably needs the money back. Damages. And, and, and who gets paid? The, 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 no, no, who gets, I'm, I'm pointing at you. Who gets paid? Me. Who are you? The buyer. No, no, no the seller. No, or the broker. No, someone. <laughs> the, this case was appealed up to the Supreme Court of the state. Is that free? No. Who gets paid? The lawyer. The lawyers. The thank you very much. Yes, yes. Winner, winner. Right. Thank you. That's a key sometimes. Right. The lawyer's got to get paid. So this goes back to the trial court, and they're going to say, "Okay, you bought another house. That's fine. We're not going to award specific performance. We're going to pay you damages." And the measure of damages is probably however much money he had to pay for a new house, mm -hmm. but also the attorney attorney's fees. fees. Thank you very much. Yeah, the lawyers always have to get paid. So even though the house, the deposit was about $500, the attorney fees would be $10,000, right? We don't know what they are. This is back in the 80s, whenever it was, right? The lawyers always get paid. Um, the reason why I think this is important to stress is that specific performance is a blunt remedy. And often it's overkill. Right? To make someone vacate their house, bring someone else in after, what, two years? No one wants that. So really, the remedy is damages. And the lawyer here probably didn't seek the correct remedy. Also, the lawyer stipulated to facts, which is not always a good idea, but they tried to prejudice the chief. Uh, OK, so now what? Goes back to the trial court. They say we found detrimental reliance. We'll order, we'll order either specific performance, or more likely, we will order um, the, uh, the uh, the damages be assessed. All right. Questions on what to do about uh, these sorts of situations, statute of frauds. Uh, yeah, Bradley. So is it? I'm, I'm just a little bit confused. When it comes to exceptions, those can only possibly apply if it's oral. Well, if it's written, you don't need an exception to the statute of frauds. The, the exceptions only kick in when it's oral. 
Because what if what if you have a written contract but it's not signed by You can still have a stopple, but it's not it's not a statute of frauds question, right? That's a breach. The reason why you can't rely on general breach terminology is because there's no written contract. Right? You only get to contract law it's a contract. It was never signed, there's no contract. That's why estoppel is this weird middle uh, 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 doctrine of equity. Okay? Time for one more question. All right, let's try a question, right? Okay. All right, let's try this one quick. We have it at three minutes left, let's try it. So question number two on page 575. Oh, the owner of Blackacre executes and delivers a deed of Blackacre to her daughter as a gift. The deed is not recorded. Subsequently, O tells A that she would like Blackacre back. And A, a dutiful daughter, hands the deed back to O and says, this land is yours again. O tears up the deed. Who owns Blackacre? Okay, so A is A, and choice B is O. Go ahead. Who owns Blackacre? The deed's ripped up. A or O? A or B? Take another 30 seconds. Another 10 seconds. I think 45 seconds is about the magic number. All right, uh, what'd you put, Amy? F-A-O-N. Why'd you put that? Um, when, a, when O gave it to A, they didn't record the deed, they didn't do anything official to transfer the title. Does recording matter? Um, What's the effect of ripping it apart? Does that matter when you rip it apart? No, yeah, because the deed's just a piece of paper. Let's see what we got. Okay, almost all of you put O. That's the correct answer. The reason why O is correct is you need to have the statute of frauds complied with the transfer property. It was signed, it was delivered, the title now belonged, right? Uh, oh, did I do it wrong? Uh, o tears up the deed, right? The Oh, yeah, no, O has it, yeah, O has it, right? Oh, wait, no, no, I'm sorry. I, I, I diverted my head. Uh, no, it's A, I'm sorry. <laughs> I did it wrong. This happens when I try it too quickly. Okay. First of all, it doesn't matter if there's recording. Okay? It does not matter if there's recording. When O transfers to A, all the signatures are there. Okay? That's a valid transaction. When A then rips it up, that has no legal effect. It stays with A. I'm sorry, I gave you the wrong choice. I flipped in my head. So I'm still getting the hang of this uh, Mr. Choice question. I, I won't get it, I'm sorry. So let me say this one more time. When O transferred it to A, that complied with the statute of frauds. Whether it was recorded or not is irrelevant. The fact that the deed was then ripped up and an oral promise was made does not override the written promise, right? An oral promise cannot override a written promise. Therefore, it stays with A. Everyone get that? I'm sorry, I flipped in my head. And let me uh, briefly, if I can, uh, uh, summarize the, uh, the class. I always like to finish class with an overview. Um, much of what we'll be talking about, this class and next and a few others, are about how to transfer property and how to transfer title. Um, today, we focus mostly on the mechanical aspects of how to do it, with contracts and, 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 and inspections and the like. But the basic underlying question is, at what point does the legal title transfer? And even if the parties don't go through all these mechanical steps, can courts order a legal process to be followed? That was the case in the second situation, right? But even if there was some sort of detrimental reliance, courts may order specific performance. But here, in this question, what matters is that a written contract trumps an oral contract. I got that one right.
still getting the hang of this multiple choice thing. I, I have to figure, if they want to say suggestions, please tell me after class. I want to, I want this to be used effectively not to confuse. All right, anything else? Robert? So when it says that she executed and delivered the deed, she needs to up a contract and have yep. the time to the deed. Exactly. Anything else? All right, I will see you all on Thursday. Thank you so much. So what I'll do now, right, um, is I will. Uh, okay, that's actually very helpful. So what I'll do is I won't close until I'm ready. Yes, sir. Yeah, coming up. Yes, yeah. six twenty-three. In general, any question longer than a sentence, just don't talk to me, okay? Cool. Or any questions? Yes. Oh, oh, you, you won't have to ask questions for any length, but, but if you send a long email, probably, I'll stay comfortable with this. Um, what, do you recommend any, like, the elements after the discussion? No, nope. nope. The examples explanation series is pretty good, uh, but 